All right. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Kevin Taylor, and please welcome to the Customer Facing Security Mechanisms, keep, Keeping People Safe Without Compromising Their Experience. Uh, we are so glad that, that you have chosen to join us, and we uh, hope that you will be um, um, educated and maybe even entertained a little bit as, as we go through this today. Um, you know, we really do live in a, in a very unique time where obviously in the last uh, 10 months, we have seen an incredible shift of uh, people working from home, the challenges of COVID. And during that time, we have, shall we say, seen an increase in cybersecurity attacks, fraud, you know, uh, fraud being uh, committed out, out there. And one of the great challenges of our time really is securing not only ourselves, but our systems. And so today we have uh, three wonderful speakers that will talk to us uh, um, about different aspects of this. And first of all, let me introduce Mark Doctor from uh, Akamai. And Mark is the senior product manager uh, in Akamai's carrier group and is responsible for DNS solutions. You know, uh, for those of you that know, maybe don't know, there have been some DNS security solutions that have been maturing um, in the industry over the last several years, and Mark's going to talk to us about those. Um, the next person we'll hear from is Sasha Medvinsky from Comscope. Um, Sasha is part of the system engineering group and focused on security aspects. And he's gonna to talk to us about the provisioning and security of, of keys and credentials, you know, at scale. And then we have Craig Pratt from Cable Labs. And Craig is gonna to talk to us about um, the challenges of Wi-Fi credentials and, um, and the management and propagation of those. And, and so with that, we welcome all of you to our session and I'm gonna hand it off to Mark. Mark, it's yours. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, how's my audio, you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is, is Mark Doctor. Uh, I'm a product manager with Akamai, and I appreciate the opportunity to share some of the observations that we have uh, around the uh, ever-evolving topic of uh, DNS encryption. Sorry. So um, I think one of the first and really the, the most obvious questions to ask is uh, how did we get here? Um, over the last several years, we have seen a uh, concerted push to increase privacy and security of communication flows, um, a shift to encrypted communication for many of the protocols that underpin the, the modern internet. Um, I think the HTTP to HTTPS transition is probably the best example of this. Uh, estimates that uh, I've seen suggest that over 95% of all web traffic uh, is encrypted today. One of the areas that we've seen increased attention over the last couple of years is uh, adding encryption of um, the DNS query traffic and response between clients and resolvers and uh, resolvers and the uh, upstream authoritatives. Uh, to enable this new shift, um, there have uh, been a bunch of new protocols introduced uh, within the IETF, uh, DNS over TLS or DOT, and DNS over HTTPS or DOH uh, in order to facilitate encryption and to wrap these DNS queries and answers via the TLS protocol. Uh, with these new protocols, there are um, additional traffic flows to consider uh, alongside the uh, unencrypted DNS uh, flows of a TCP and 53, uh, port 53. Um, in situations where the OS stub resolver supports DOT or DOH, uh, these encrypted flows would typically bypass the proxy resolver that exists on the in-home CPE and usually directly uh, query the upstream uh, network uh, operator resolver using those protocols. Uh, in situations where an application uh, such as the browser <clears throat> supports uh, DNS over HTTPS, then those encrypted tra traffic flows would uh, typically also bypass the CPE and uh, in some cases use third party uh, over the top public DNS resolvers. Uh, you do also have a situation where hybrid traffic flows where some queries will use the on-network uh, CPE, 
uh, potentially over an encrypted DNS. And uh, some applications will do queries across DOH, either to the uh, available on network uh, um, upstream network operator resolver uh, or to a public DOH resolver. Um, uh, those, those flows are also possible. In addition to that, uh, there are initiatives around encryption of the resolver to authoritative traffic. Uh, this is an ongoing work effort, uh, as well as other proposals to do DNS over QUIC and DNS over DTLS. Um, however, the majority of the existing client implementations that we see in this space today are very much focused on uh, the DOT and DOH protocols. Uh, in terms of those client implementations, the table that uh, we, we show over there represents what I would call a snapshot of the most um, uh, mainstream clients that are available today, uh, as well as their capabilities um, as of uh, early September. Here we do observe a, a rather fragmented ecosystem uh, with clear differences across uh, some of the, the client implementations that are shown. Uh, we did observe an early preference for DOT on the operating system and the CPE networking stacks. Um, and more recently, uh, Apple has come out with support for both protocols, both DOT and DOH, um, as well as Microsoft uh, currently preferring DOH, but indicating that this may change depending on, uh, on how things uh, evolve. Um, we also do see a very clear preference for DOH on the browser and the third party application side. So this is primarily your, your mobile apps. Um, one of the, the most notable differences across this ecosystem, and really I think a key challenge when it comes to how uh, operators are able to provision uh, network res resolvers to their subscribers is the variation of mechanisms that these clients are using to discover and uh, configure DNS encryption capable resolvers. Uh, for example, we have a, a collection of clients where they may redirect the user's DNS queries to off network, uh, third-party public DNS resolvers. So this is really uh, primarily limited to Mozilla Firefox today, which has an opt-out mechanism um, in, in select geographies uh, to be able to steer traffic from the browser to uh, public cloud uh, resolvers in, in some situations. Uh, we do see that some clients will dynamically auto-upgrade from unencrypted DNS to uh, using encrypted DNS, DO, DOH or DOT, uh, using the existing resolver so this is typically referred to as a same provider auto upgrade. Uh, Android, I think is the best example of this. Uh, another difference is whether or not these upgrade mechanisms are limited to a predefined static list of DNS providers. Uh, this is the case with Firefox, uh, Chrome and Microsoft today. Um, and really lastly, I think uh, what kinds of controls that we see uh, each of these clients exposed to uh, either network operators or uh, enterprise administrators uh, in terms of how those administrators can influence the use of uh, encrypted resolvers uh, within within their networks. <clears throat> um, these new protocols, the evolving DNS client landscape and uh, the potential for new intermediaries in the traffic flow can sometimes obscure how network operators uh, provide mission critical services uh, to their subscribers and in certain cases actually create inefficiencies in these services uh, that a lot of subscribers rely on today. Um, these changes can also create implications for service providers or network operators who today already operate provably secure networks but are now being tasked to support these new protocols in order to preserve uh, or improve the existing subscribers experience. Um, this includes things like ensuring the value added services, so your parental controls or uh, any other network level filtering that is offered through the provider's DNS you know, infrastructure remains functional and uh, still able to protect subscribers from uh, internet threats. Uh, that these services are not inadvertently uh, uh, bypassed or purposely disabled, as is the case with uh, parental controls when these DNS encryption capable clients attempt to upgrade to a, a more secure transport. Uh, or in some cases attempt to go uh, off network and that the provider can continue to optimize the subscriber experience for example uh, using the dns to enable uh, your on network content distribution while at the same time mitigating the risk that comes with uh, third party of the top provider inefficiencies or potential outages that uh, may impact the, uh, the user's experience <clears throat> 
Uh, of course, when it comes to introduction of, introduction of any new technology, uh, this usually comes at a cost. Um, over the last year or so, Optimize worked with several providers across the globe, helping them prepare and deploy DOT and, and DOH uh, on, on their DNS infrastructure. Uh, some of the lessons learned out of that is when you're deploying DOT or, or DOH on, on your resolvers, uh, providers do need to account for the operational impact of supporting TCP-based uh, encrypted transport on this existing infrastructure. Uh, this includes building an understanding of how the client implementations will drive scaling on that infrastructure. Uh, this, this is understanding areas of um, uh, connection setup overhead, understanding how clients will reuse established sessions, uh, how to best tune resolvers and the operating systems for TCP as well as um, uh, the existing uh, more well understood UP based workflows. And as is often the case, uh, there remains quite a lot of unfinished business when it comes to DNS encryption. Uh, I think the most apparent uh, being the obvious problem that today there are no real standards that define the discovery behavior or uh, how uh, to do network-based provisioning uh, between the DNS encryption capable clients and the DNS encryption capable resolvers. And this has somewhat predictably resulted in a, a rather fragmented uh, client imp implement implementation space and um, lots of different mechanisms when it comes to how these clients can interact with these, these services. So standardization of these mechanisms remains a, a, a large effort and an ongoing work in progress across several IETF working groups. Uh, as of September, um, we see quite a few proposals which are focused on trying to address the solution space. Uh, some of these proposals are informational in that uh, they just attempt to define the problem space. Uh, others are uh, recommending use of existing network technologies in order to bootstrap uh, client and, and server. Uh, there are other proposals that focus on using the DNS itself to advertise capabilities into, uh, into these clients. And then of course there are creation of new layers that can uh, deal with the provisioning and the discovery of these uh, DNS encryption capable services. Uh, retroactive standardization of infield technology is always difficult. And what we have seen over the last few months is a lot of good progress um, has been made in the space, whereas maybe a year and a half before that, uh, things were, were quite uh, stalled in, in some areas. And a lot of this, this recent forward momentum towards standardization of this behavior um, has really been driven through industry participation in open communities, such as the Encrypted DNS Deployment Initiative. Um, this initiative is, is a uh, bringing together of protocol designers, your uh, software developers, your implementers, your network and DNS operators of, of all types and sizes, uh, your cloud providers, application providers, content delivery networks, there's many others who, who are involved in this. And one of the, the things that we've, we've noticed here is that ongoing and active participation by the network operator community is absolutely critical when it comes to ensuring the same just works user experience that exists today and, and is, um, is well understood is that this experience is preserved and that uh, future deployment of DOT and uh, DOH on provider resolvers remains compatible with kind of these well-established operational systems and, uh, and processes. So to summarize, um, DNS encryption has been a highly visible topic for more than two years now. Uh, there are many client implementations out there, uh, including those from the major operating system, uh, browser, mobile apps, uh, CPE vendors. There are several scaled public DNS resolution services that support it today. And providers do need to be aware of this landscape and prepared to respond to the opportunities that it does bring. This involves doing various things, um, contribution um, and, and kind of hands-on uh, when it comes to the uh, creation of the relevant standards to ensure that this DNS encryption uh, and the implementations around that uh, do continue to deliver the optimal user experience and uh, importantly remain compatible with the, the operations best practices that are in place today. Uh, it's important to communicate about existing privacy and security practices that are already provided with the operator's DNS service. Um, it's important to communicate about DNS data usage, uh, retention policies, it's important to take credit for privacy and haunting measures that are already in place that uh, in many cases subscribers are, are just not aware of. 
making sure to implement best practices when it comes to the answer resolution, making sure that the providers resolvers are, are better than the OTT alternatives, uh, make sure they're more re responsive, they're more reliable, uh, that they're resilient and secure. Um, consider deployment or expansion of DNS encryption aware value added services. Uh, these are services that can protect subscribers. Uh, these are things around enabling network protections that can block intruders, uh, your phishing, your malware, your bots, all of these things which today can invade user privacy, uh, steal valuable personal data, and uh, of course, impact the, the subscriber's experience. <clears throat> and with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time today. Um, I hope that you did find the material useful, and I do encourage everyone to uh, check out the accompanying paper, which goes into a lot more detail than I was able to cover off in this session. Uh, my contact details are listed there. Uh, I'm more than happy to have additional discussions around this and happy to answer any additional questions that you, you may have on the topic. Um, so Jay, if you would maybe like to hand off to the next speaker, please. I believe it's uh, Sasha. Hi, I'm Sasha Medvinsky, uh, engineering fellow with the Comscope, and uh, uh, this talk on the paper uh, about provisioning of uh, uh, various types of cryptographic credentials, keys, and certificates that may be needed for uh, all kinds of devices, a wide variety of mobile devices, telecommunication devices, wireless network infrastructure, etc. So uh, the, this is the, the outline of the presentation. We'll, we'll go through the, uh, the scenarios and use cases, why you would need that kind of over the air provisioning, why just installing all the keys and certificates in a factory isn't uh, sufficient, at least not in all cases. And then we'll go through the architecture of this uh, Opus provisioning system of credentials that we manage and Comscope and uh, uh, we'll go through the uh, one use case that's uh, uh, in more detail here in the slides and then uh, go over other use cases and authorization um, requirements that are covered uh, in much more detail in the paper. So uh, why do we need this uh, over the air provisioning of credentials? Um, well, uh, there's many different reasons or many use cases when you need to provide keys and certificates after devices already deployed in the field, uh, perhaps in the user's home. Uh, in some cases, uh, a network operator signs up uh, with a particular content service, which requires a, a DRM that wasn't present already in the device, uh, or maybe the content service applies to devices fielded and the devices that are still gonna be manufactured, but you need to support both. Uh, and um, so the other has to be a way, a secure mechanism to provision those credentials as well as the software that, that goes along with that service. Uh, and then in other cases, uh, the operators have made a switch from one DRM system to another, maybe for the same content service. There may be different business reasons or uh, technical reasons that the content provider, uh, sorry, the service provider and the operator will want the ability to switch between DRM systems. Uh, they don't want to be tied to just one. Uh, and then uh, some other use cases are not to do with the DRM, but maybe the operator has their own security system for managing devices. It is becoming quite common now the operator creates their own certificate authority and they want to provide certificates to those devices so they can securely identify a device and do miscellaneous device management to do configuration, troubleshooting, et cetera, with their own PKI. And that may require uh, installation of that, those certificates in the field. Uh, once the, the operator comes up with that security system, uh, some devices would have been already fielded and some may, may be able to get those certificates of manufacturers. So you need uh, certificate installation in, in both places. Um, or uh, there could be a, a case where uh, the operator uh, has some added value services that require a particular DRM system that charges the operator or manufacturer both a fee 
Uh, so once you install software or uh, credentials, you know that there is a fee that goes to the DRM provider. It's not needed for every single device in the system. It's not the most cost efficient method to just go ahead and install everything in a factory. So in those cases, once a subscriber subscribes to that service, they're willing to provide whatever extra values provided by that service, um, you know, maybe providing some content to their mobile devices or taking the content with them on a trip or any other services. And then for those cases, once there's a sign up, then the operator will push software update to that device and also provide credentials that weren't there before. Um, yeah, another use case is that technology is always evolving. For example, uh, it's quite common in the uh, video devices to have uh, something like HDCP that protects uh, uncompressed digital video and DTCP that protects compressed digital video. But in the recent years, a, the licensing authorities came up with HDCP version two that provides uh, protection with a higher security for uh, high value 4K and uh, um, uh, other uh, you know, for high value content. And same thing for DTCP, there is DTCP version two, which is for higher volume compressed content. And so, you know, if you have devices already in the field and you wanna add those technologies, then you may need to also provide credentials, you know, over the air. And uh, there's also a common use case where uh, in addition to, you know, providing content to say a setup device, there may be uh, uh, the user has a mobile devices, phones or PC, the tablet in their home and they wanna get content to those devices where it's very unlikely that you can, you know, make a deal with a, say a tablet provider to put in new credentials in there during their manufacturing. Those have to be installed uh, in the field once the subscriber signs up for that service. But here's the architecture of the system that we manage that uh, is able to provision all types of credentials in you know, varying uh, types of devices. Um, you know, although there are many types of use cases, the uh, underlying system provides a common service to provide secure, unique credentials to each client or device. So in the middle, we have this Opus server. This is the provisioning server for those keys and credentials. Uh, it has uh, different buckets of credentials for different types of devices, different types of credentials that are encrypted differently in many cases. And they're most of the time, they're not secure or encrypted right there on the server. Uh, on the left, uh, we have the offline key generation facility where whenever possible, we process the keys and credentials there. Um, often they come from an external source, especially for DRM, there is all sorts of licensing authorities for DRM as well as copy protection keys. So those are received usually PGP encrypted and then they're decrypted, re-encrypted and packaged exactly as needed by the target device. Uh, a lot of times that's dictated by a security chip. Uh, the uh, security chip um, or chip with the ARM trial zone uh, feature, they'll have their own requirements, how the keys need to be packaged and encrypted. And so uh, there'll be different buckets of these created even for the same type of credential for different classes of devices. So they're created, packaged in a totally offline system and then they're moved uh, to an online uh, system here called PK Loader still within the same facility uh, and then uh, moved to this Opus server uh, that uh, makes them available for uh, consumption by authorized devices. And also you can see there's a firewall shown there. There's perimeter security, uh, vulnerability scanning, et cetera, all uh, common uh, expect security uh, features that are required for high security service, both in the offline facility, despite the fact that it's offline, it still has all those um, uh, security um, elements as well as in the online server. It also has the, the same kind of firewall as perimeter security in, IP address filtering and so on. Um, and uh, there's multiple layers of security applied in every link, both you know, in the sessions between uh, the, the, to get to the Opus server and to the device, uh, as well as uh, for the data at rest in the database, it has additional layers of security end to end to uh, the final target device, as well as uh, to the, um, uh, uh, you know, database, uh, this, uh, 
destination in the server as well as the uh, randomly generated session keys that are different for every session that protect against replays, for example. And the system is ordered something like this where you're handling uh, you know, lots of different keys that are protecting high value content. Uh, it has to have every security precaution and it has to be, uh, you know, have, have audit trails of everything that it does so they can be audited internally or externally as needed. So um, this is more of the description of the architecture to add here. Uh, we also use hardware security, uh, the HSM uh, there's HSM in the offline facility when the keys are packaged and encrypted, all the encryption and signing keys reside in that HSM. Uh, we don't uh, allow, you know, something in software where uh, even uh, trusted personnel might make a mistake and somehow expose a piece of software or a key file. They're always protected inside a hardware security module. And then uh, the same thing is done on the Opus server. Uh, the online server also has a hardware security module and uh, it, all the encryption and signing keys are there. Uh, there are some use cases that are more described in more detail in, in the uh, paper where the online server actually does have to sign credentials right there on the fly for various reasons. That maybe it's a time-related uh, time system where the credentials have to be created and delivered very quickly where you can't afford that offline operation. So again, that hardware security module and all the other security mechanisms protect the additional services that might reside in that online server. And uh, this is the use case, the main use case that uh, it actually starts in the factory. The best way to identify the device that's gonna request the credentials is to install some sort of identity when it's coming out of the factory. So an OEM here would uh, generate a credentials. Most of the time it'll be an X19 certificate and RSA or elliptic curve private key. Uh, we do have ways of handling devices that are not manufactured in the factory, but uh, it's more secure when it is and we can uh, get uh, the credentials installed from an OEM. So then that device will um, be deployed in the field and then later on uh, the, there is a request from an operator usually that there is a need to install the new types of credentials to that device that weren't there before. And then we go through uh, configuration and setup of the Opus server to make that sure that authorization is set up properly. We would get the certificate chain of the OEM so that we trust that certificate authority that OEM uses to verify their devices that are requesting additional credentials. And that trust is not general for everything. It's just for that specific type of credential for that operator's name, the operator that wants to install the credentials. So there's a flexible authorization configuration as needed for that service. Um, and uh, then once the configuration is set up, then we start uh, generating or receiving those credentials in the offline generation facility. Uh, they get moved to the Opus server and then they're available uh, to be accessed. And the device submits a request, it's signed and encrypted. Uh, usually would have a, a device identifier, some sort of a SOC ID or a serial number uh, or some other ID, you know, from a uh, device that's not manufactured. And then the, from the server will check authorization of the operator that's submitting the request, operator IDs in the request, authorization of a device model based on the OEM certificate authority, uh, sometimes authorization based on specific device ID, if applicable. After all the authorization checks pass, then uh, the server will get the data, it will um, retain the original encryption end to end, but there is additional session encryption applied and the credentials are returned back to that device. And then we provide an SDK uh, for integration to be available to, to uh, process the message, decrypt the credentials and install them on that device. And uh, this is all uh, uh, what I described in the slide to add here that for the one-time session key, generally we use a key agreement protocol such as Diffie-Hellman or elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Those provide profit forward secrecy. They're randomly generated in every message exchange by both sides. And uh, this is a list of additional uh, use cases that the paper covers. 
uh, there's additional uh, a case where the operator wants to verify a subscription before providing the particular credentials. And subscription in that case is provided by an authorization token created by a gateway or a DVR device in the user's home. If the uh, user uh, subscribes to that service, then uh, uh, the gateway will, uh, based on its configuration, will generate this authorization token that gets passed in through to the office server. And uh, if authorization is confirmed, then the credentials are installed. And then there's uh, use cases uh, for in a more detail how we handle the lists of the specific device identifiers that if, if that's what the operator needs. Uh, it, you know, they can be processed offline and there are some use cases for processing them offline that provide some additional security, but uh, it also you know, means uh, that there's some lag in, in the uh, response. You, know, you need to get those offline uh, th those device identifiers into the offline facility and process them and then move the data that's packaged into the online server. So there are some cases when that delay is not acceptable and so we also can do this directly in the online server uh, as needed. And uh, there's, and we also cover some future use cases. The, th these other ones are already supported today and then there's others that will be uh, upcoming. So yeah, in summary, um, uh, there is a real need, a very strong need for such a provisioning system or various uh, credentials. And uh, uh, there is a wide variety of use cases that all have their own challenges, but they can be supported by a single system that has enough flexibility and scalability to cover all those use cases. Uh, and that's covered in more detail in the paper. And then that, that system is always evolving and what we have today will not support those kind of use cases of tomorrow and it's very anticipating you know, a number of new use cases that will have to be covered by the same system in the future. And um, I think that's good. Thank you. Um, so I guess we could pass the control now to Craig Pratt to go with the next presentation. Okay, thanks, Sasha. Let's see if my controls are working here. Oh, there we go. Oh. Okay, there we go. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Craig Pratt. I'm with Cable Labs. I'm a lowly software engineer. Um, just here putting on my security hat and I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Wi-Fi passwords and where, th where things are and, and a little bit about where, th where we think things are going. Um, so I wanted to give a little overview of existing Wi-Fi security mechanisms. Um, then some of the uh, provisioning onboarding technologies that are in development right now, uh, specifically DPP. And also what kind of uh, future network security technologies are enabled by DPP um, and similar onboarding methods. Uh, but to kind of understand that, uh, I wanna give a little, a very, very, well, hopefully brief primer of, on how security is performed in Wi-Fi. I think everyone knows about uh, WPA2 personal passwords. They're great. Um, and uh, they, uh, you know, they're easy to share and they generally have worked pretty well so far, but there's, you know, some definite issues everyone, everyone, everyone probably knows about, right? Um, you know, in terms of once you've shared a password, it can't be unshared once. Uh, so, you know, if uh, having two girls, uh, ex-boyfriends are always an issue. Um, then changing the Wi-Fi password becomes a bigger issue as you add more devices, um, especially with IoT devices. They don't have a very good, um, as if anyone's tried to, a very good um, control, very good uh, use flow for changing passwords. They kind of are very much optimized towards initial onboarding. So the um, so they're they're not. If you if you want to change a Wi-Fi password with a network full of IT, IoT devices, you got a real headache on your hand. Um, 
but let's get a little bit into how how uh, WPA2 personal passwords work. It's pretty simple. The passphrase itself is used to derive what's called a um, called a P, uh, PMK, called a pairwise master key. So basically, every time a device authenticates it, it's and associates for whatever that time period is, it's using a unique key. But with uh, WPA2 personal, every time uh, every device is deriving its key from the same PMK. Um, this has a couple consequences, most of which is that any de even though each device does have its own pair, was pairwise being key name there, its own its own specific key. Any other device on the network can actually derive any other device's key, um, and so it can observe their their individual traffic. Um, this is in particular how the four-way handshake works, and I. Uh, we don't want to go through all this here, obviously, right now, but the uh, it's described a little more in the paper, but it's common to all of the security um, establishment methods and Wi-Fi today. Um, they all, all the, the AP and the station all start with the shared secret, the pairwise master key, um, and then they all end up with a pairwise transient key, PTK, uh, or temporal, sorry, temporal transient, same thing. Um, where um, where they use the four-way handshake to basically establish that that key on a session by session basis, as well as something called a group key that allows for the um, sharing of group traffic by all the devices. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go over a little bit more a little bit more about some of these um, in, in the next slides. Sorry, I have a little lag here. Okay. Um, WPA2 and 3 Enterprise, um, again, it all comes down to uh, establishing a PMK, but they use, they, it, it basically has a variety of methods as disposal, mostly designed to integrate with existing enterprise based radius um, type systems um, and using user credentials, a certificate, sometimes passwords. Um, and that sort of thing. It's kind of a, it's a very extensible mechanism, but it's also pretty, uh, pretty complicated and requires quite a few moving parts. But it's uh, it integrates well in enterprise environments. Um, the new the new kid on the block is WPA3 Personal SAE. Uh, it's called simultaneously simultaneous exchange of equals. It basically allows you to use a password, but it's much more secure than than the pat well I should say passphrase um, used in WPA2 personal um, and it has a whole separate mechanism that occur that occurs prior to the share the, the shared derivation of the PMK but again uh, big picture here is you end up in the same box here called this four-way handshake and that's how you establish your your keys and Wi-Fi now there's some interesting um, uh, market market uh, derived solutions out there um, that people are incorporating that use that use um, a per device passphrase. Um, I won't really name all those, but but basically the idea is that every you can give every device its own its own password. The issue with this is either you have to identify the device by its Mac or by its password. The issue with Macs right now that's you know, Ethernet addresses, MAC addresses, um, is it's cumbersome for the user obviously to identify what their MAC address is, right? I mean that's not that's not a very a very good use model. Um, and B, even even if and when they can do that, MACs are are now a, considered a privacy concern, and devices generate them dynamically um, in some cases. So there is no what is your device MAC address? That's not really even a that's not even really going to be a thing going forward. Um, so, and the issue with uh, passwords is you say you give a device a password. Well, basically it's going to be, um, you're going to have a trust on first use scenario there. So whatever device happens to have that password or what device is um, will be used to authenticate. Then the, the AP will try to generate a Mac association at that point forward. And then we end up back in the same kind of down the same issue with the Macs 
in doing that. So these issues, these solutions are out there now, but they're, they're a bit they're pretty fragile because of this um, because of this Mac issue um, going forward. So in summary, the you know with the issues with the technologies today, um, WPA2 personal, you need to obviously manually enter the address on every device. There's no revocation and it's not truly secure because like I say, any, any station can decrypt any other station's traffic. WPA3 personal is more secure, but it has the same password and revocation issues um, as WPA2, but it is more secure for sure. Uh, WPA3 does allow for the separated revocable, revocable credentials and it does integrate well with, with enterprise authentication systems, but it doesn't, um, but generally these systems are work, are, are, and I say generally, um, associate credentials with users, things like IoT devices, you know, they're their own thing. They don't necessarily belong to any particular person. You know, if you have a light bulb, is that, you know, is that moms or dads or, you know, whose is it? Um, and the infrastructure is complicated today. And on top, but on top of that, really, none of these really provide that level, this extra, this higher level, this higher layer, this provisioning and reprovisioning, bulk provisioning. Um, and I think the most important of those is secure device identity. So let's talk about that a little bit and what that can enable. Oops, first of all, DPP. So DPP solves that last, basically solves that everything on that prior slide here by um, basically a device coming with a, it comes with a, some kind of a, uh, for instance, there's a number of ways to do this. This is just one example, but it can come with like a card or something that, that has a unique um, URI on it that contains credentials unique to that device that's just used to initially perform the onboarding. Um, the uh, user scans this code with an app they have on their phone, which fills a role of a device called a configurator in the protocol. And well then um, basically using, a, using Wi-Fi wi public action frames, push the credentials to the device. The device then can use those credentials, can store and use those credentials persistently to um, authenticate with the access point um, and vice versa. It's mutual authentication in that case because it's provided not just an authentication key but also the, the root, what's called the C signed key, which then the um, station can use to authenticate the AP, which, which isn't there in any of the other um, methods uh, discussed here. Um, there's also a slightly similar variation to this, which is a little easier and and probably will be the it's, it's probably easier to for vendors to implement and has a has a a little cleaner model where basically the AP um, kind of wears two hats. It wears a configurator hat and a and then a standard access point hat, and then the you have some kind of a um, app on your phone which has a trust relationship with the AP perhaps it's provided by the manufacturer of the AP um, or 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 a vendor um, and it basically all that authentication happens by proxying through the AP but still the same concept you're pushing credentials to the station and then going and then once that's initially done the the AP and the device can establish their um, their trust and their uh, authentication using those provided credentials called a connector. Um, a connector is this uh, pretty cool little thing. It's basically a, it, it has the net access key here, which that's basically what we're talking about in all the other pictures, which provides it it's the ability to, uh, um, the credentials it needs to connect to the access point. But then it can also have other things like groups, um, expirations, it can, it's, it's extensible. Um, and this is kind of where really some of the, some of the future applications come in. Um, I, I totally stole this from the DPP spec, by the way. Um, so, and it, and it does this by basically, the connectors basically perform a pre-authentication. Again, this is going back to this four-way handshake. 
um, these connectors are used to to perform um, authentic to basically allow the AP in the station per, to perform authentication before the four-way handshake. So they independently derive the PMK um, much more securely than in the other mechanisms and, and using mutual authentication. And then enter the same four-way handshake that's used with all the, with all the devices. Um, so the real benefits of DPP is it's obviously easy to deploy sh either shared password per station credentials and inter even enterprise credentials to devices using DPP. You can push certs, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but the, the really interesting thing is the onboarding workflow provides us uh, the opportunity to interact with the user. And so you can, you can designate that, hey, this device should only be on the network during certain hours, you know, um, that sort of thing, you know, this kind of parental control features. Um, you kind of get that, that opportunity during onboarding to, to disposition the device on your network and decide how you want it to live there. Um, uh, mutual authentication, like I mentioned. Reconfiguration is a big thing. This is uh, something that's just recently been introduced for DPP, which allows things like the SSID to be changed on your devices um, after after they've initially joined, which today would be a is a major a major pain. Um, so you can, and then it can be implemented a number of ways. Like I mentioned in those two diagrams, you can do it direct provisioning, AP based, and then even something called bulk provisioning, which is, you know, would allow you, allows you to provision a whole bunch of devices at once. Um, if, you know, if say you have a whole bunch of cameras or sensors you want to put on your network. And really this is the most interesting thing to me is, they, is that these connectors that DVP introduces provide an, a real, a true identity um, with and that identity can be uh, can be securely bound with extensible metadata, um, so it removes this dependency on, on on static MAC addresses, which aren't static anymore, and can can solve the kind of applications people are using today with MAC addresses, um, and enable and this enables some ne advanced network and device policies and features. Um, let me show you one of those. So this is one. For instance, where you can you can segment your network um, based on the like I say when you're onboarding your devices, you can put them in groups, or you can or the onboarding application can try to to determine what group they belong in and and hint you at that fact um, when you initially onboard it, um, and then you can even quarantine devices that are established to have a problem. Um, and you can separate your IoT devices from your other devices, so your light bulbs can't access your file server. You know, uh, things, things like that. Um, and yeah, so let me try to. Whoops, whoa, one too many. So yeah, devices can be quarantined. Also, um, something that's really that's really useful here is is things like. Um, uh, device policies can be can be enforced because again you have this concept of a device having identity you can bind policy to it so you can say thing you can and you can also bind um, these new manufacturer um, description formats that say hey this device should only need to connect to these two servers on the internet which prevents you know a network of you know of iot devices from being used to launch uh distribute you know DDoS attacks and and things like that. So, and and then of course there's the standard stuff that people want to do with identities, where it's like I said, mention you want, might want to limit devices to being on the network at certain hours um, uh, of the day, or or to have restricted access at certain times of the day. It really enables that, whereas today that stuff is really going to start breaking, and the solutions that are out there today, as this Mac. Um, as these uh, these new MAC addresses are are pushed out, these dynamic MAC addresses. Um, anyway, that's it. Uh, there's a lot more in the paper about the specifics about how that is done, like how you how you go about um, using uh, 
these these DPP identifiers and whatnot to bind devices to policy um, and provide these advanced kind of features. But of course, don't have enough time to go too far into those today. But I hope that that at least uh, uh, what's your appetite towards looking at more of the details in the paper. So thank you for your time. And I guess it's back to you, Kevin. Kevin, we got your ear off. Little okay. gobbled, but carry okay, on. Great, great. Yeah, I had some audio problems, and my laptop has been complaining about uh, system resources uh, might impact your audio. So I wanted to check. You know, um, so so first of all, thank you very much, Craig and Mark and Sasha, for putting that together. Uh, we've had some questions come in, so I want to uh, jump over to those. And uh, Sasha, I think I'll, I'll start with you um, because I'm interested in the question. So, so the question um, was, um, have you thought about your strategy to provide quantum safe mechanisms to deliver these credentials for filled long lived devices under, under quantum threat? And, and I think this is a brilliant question because it, it feels to me that we're, we're, we're sort of at this inflection point where crypto um, algil agility is becoming important. So, so what do you think? I mean, how does crypto agility and, and the specter of quantum-based computing coming our, our way um, impact uh, what you're doing and, and these systems that, that provision keys? Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Uh, well, yeah, of course, uh, crypto agility is very important to be able to replace, uh, introduce new algorithms uh, and bigger key sizes uh, over time. It would apply to both the quantum safe algorithms and any other, uh, uh, the ones that are not quantum safe. I mean, there's a good probability that uh, there'll be some other security concern that will be found by research that may or may not be associated with the quantum computing. Uh, quantum computing, uh, I would say, you know, maybe 10 to 20 years out, but systems should be designed well in advance to have the this key agility to specify algorithm ID for every type of signing and encryption that you use uh, so that they can be updated. And our server uh, will be updated as, as needed. There are some challenges on the server and the client side where especially where those algorithms are in hardware. On the server side, we like to use the HSM for everything because it's more secure. So it, it depends on you know when uh, the, the is when, when there is a need to switch to a higher security algorithm, which may be quantum safe. If that's not implemented in HSM, then we will uh, do you know what we can to secure it in software uh, and go to the HSM when finally the HSM vendors support it. Uh, on the client side, it's similar as some uh, devices. You know, will we'll have a security chip or a SOC with a trust zone uh, that that has those algorithms implemented in. Uh, if the quantum safe algorithm isn't there, then maybe difficult to put into that device. But we'll make sure that that th there's the algorithms are identified and they can be replaced as needed, including for the quantum safe algorithms. Uh, yeah, also the quantum uh, computing attacks are more relevant to public key algorithms, so like signatures or public key based encryption. So uh, it's not as convenient to use, say, symmetric OTP keys. But if you do have those available. That can be another way to to bypass the uh, concerns with the quantum uh, computing. If, if you get a database of all of the OTP keys for those devices and we use symmetric algorithm and just increase the key size, that that would normally protect against uh, quantum computing attacks. All right, great, thank you. Um, yeah, lot lots to explore there. Um, Craig, maybe a question for you. I you know one of the questions that came in was when implemented, will users have to manually change DNS settings in browsers to do? And, and, and I'm kind of curious, do you want to talk a little bit about the impact to users and, and, and applications from maybe just for both do and, and, and dot? Sure, um, Kevin, I think that was for me, right? Yep. 
Yep. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, so uh, I, I caught the first question. You might need to repeat the, the second half of the question. Um, so when uh, I think one of the, an aspect of that question was uh, users manually changing uh, DNS settings in their browsers, correct? Yes. Yeah, exactly right. And, 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 and so I have to admit, as I read the question, I'm sitting here going, so it, could I have multiple browsers running, you know, to different those servers? I mean, how, how does that look and, and how does it impact um, our customers? Um, yeah, that, that does make for an interesting traffic flow. So I think Looking at it from, from the top down, um, I think the first statement that I can make there is that pretty much all...